Son and Holy Spirit, amen. Loving Father, we adore you. We thank you for all of your many blessings, but we praise you for who you are. You are a God of love and a God of mercy. We ask you today to reveal yourself to us, to show us who you are. We ask that you pour out your blessings upon us and all those whom we love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, so if you guys have been listening to me, which I hope you have, um, just kidding. Uh, huh? No. Um, there is a word, a smaller word, in the word re- revelation. And so the team cannot answer this question. There is a smaller word in the word revelation. What word is that? Reveal. Yes. So today we're going to talk about divine or God's revelation. So it's God is revealing himself to us. For we can know that God exists through our minds, but we cannot know who God is unless he reveals himself. So I can know that Roy exists, but unless Roy reveals himself to me, I don't really know who Roy is. He has to disclose who he is. And today we're going to talk about the two ways that God has disclosed or revealed himself to us. He's done it in two ways. He's done it through tradition and through scripture. And so the ways that you can kind of remember tradition and scripture is that tradition is the oral teaching of God. So it's given orally by mouth. And scripture is the written teaching of God. So there are two ways that God has communicated with us, orally and written. So both are important because without them, we cannot know who God is. So I, like I said, we can know that God exists um, by our minds through our reason, but we cannot know who he is without tradition and without scripture. How can I say that, before we go into tradition and scripture, how can I say that we can know God exists through reason? Well, for example, if you were to open up a laptop computer and see the motherboard of the computer, you can see all its intricacies, its design, and you would say, ah, there must be a designer. This could not have just happened, dropped from the sky, and boom, here's a laptop, right? There was a creator, a designer of this device. Same thing uh, with us, that um, we are intricately designed, and there's symmetry, there's all kinds of beautiful things when we look at the human person. And when we look at the human person, we, we have to know, ah, there's a designer, there's a creator. Um, and so we can know through our minds that God exists, that he is our creator. But we cannot know that he is a father, that he is a son, and that he is Holy Spirit without him revealing himself to us. So that's what I wanted to say in the beginning of our class today. Okay, so following our, hey there, welcome. Following our little outline, the introduction. So God speaks to his children and he reveals his eternal love. So he reveals who he is to us through tradition and scripture. And it's good that he speaks to us because we need him to reveal himself in order for us to know him. Because God is love, the nature of love is to know and to be known. We want to um, to know and to be known. That's the nature of a relationship. 
is to know and to be known. And God wants us to know him, and he wants us to be loved by him, right? So he speaks to us through his messengers. And in the Old Testament, he spoke, as we talked about the last time. And remember, the Old Testament, the Bible is in two, Old Testament and New Testament. The Old Testament is all about the coming of the Messiah, the one that would save humanity from sin. So it's all about Jesus, really. Um, But he hadn't come yet. Uh, New Testament is about the life of Christ, Jesus, and um, welcome. Uh, and so, uh, so God speaks to us through his messengers. Adam and Eve would be um, examples of messengers, Moses and the prophets, and finally, Jesus, the word of God. Um, the Father speaks to us through His Son. And if, we, if you have Bibles, if team, if you could help other people find where this is. Um, but in the, towards the end of the book of the Bible, there is the Gospel of John, chapter 1. And if you're like, I don't know where to look, you could always look at the beginning and find the table of contents and look for, under the New Testament, the Gospel of John. Now, that's a little bit tricky because there is also the, some letters of John. So you don't want the letters of John, you want the Gospel of John. Yes. Yes. You take the right half, which is the New Testament, more things, and then by that half, the picture of the gospel. Yes. So that's great. That's Good idea. There's no shame of looking at the table of contents. Yes. There's many ways that you can find it. Um, or if you wanted to cheat and use your phone to look up John chapter 1, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, <clears throat> but it's good to use the actual book um, to get used to that. So can I have a volunteer um, for John chapter 1 and I'll stop you when I want to stop and make comments. Um, Ruby? I'll come closer with the mic. Mm -hmm. Yep. The word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Oops, stop. Nah. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Right? What does it say? The Word was God. Yes. With God and was God. So... We're talking about in the beginning, before time began, there was God. And in God, there is Father, there is Son, there is Holy Spirit. And next week, I'll be talking about the Trinity, how there are three persons in one God. But just know that the second person of the Trinity is Jesus, and he is God. So before time began, God has always been God. There's never been a time where God was not God because he's outside of time. Okay, mind-blowing. <laughs> right? I can go on and on about that, but um, just know that Jesus is the word. So as we approach the word of God, as we approach the gospels, as we approach um, the Bible, know that Jesus is the word that is spoken by the Father eternally. Okay, keep reading. He was in the beginning with God, and through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life 
darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Okay, good. So can I borrow that for a sec? Awesome. Yeah. This, he, meaning Jesus, was in the beginning with God the Father. All things were made through him, through Christ. So everything was made through Jesus. And without Jesus was not anything made that was made. In Jesus was life. I'm just replacing all the personal pronouns with Jesus so that you can get it in your heads. Um, in him, in Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Okay, so that'll. My point here is that the Word is God, right? So that's why we have such a reverence for Scripture, for the Bible, because it's. It's Jesus being revealed to us. Okay. And then on our outline here, I have a quote from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In time past, in times past, God spoke in partial and various ways to our ancestors. Let me break that apart. So he only spoke in partial, partial ways to the ancestors. So that would be like Adam, Abraham, Noah, um, Moses, right? Um, so he only spoke partially. But as we continue on this sentence, it says, in these last days, he spoke to us through a son. So he has spoken to us through Jesus. Jesus is the fullness of revelation. He is the fullness of divine revelation. Okay, so, point number two. Divine revelation is basically how God reveals himself and how he transmits the divine message. So it's really twofold. Um, he reveals himself so he reveals who he is, and he reveals the divine message or the plan that he has for us, right? And God the Father reveals himself and his plan for us in two ways, tradition and scripture. So remember, I said at the beginning of class, tradition is the oral teaching of God, and scripture is the written teaching of God. So we'll start with tradition. Because interestingly enough, without tradition, we don't have the Bible. Uh, the Bible comes from tradition. Okay? Because the truth is, the word of God was spoken orally and then written down. Right? Okay. So, under sacred tradition, uh, that's point A, number one, God speaks to us through the tradition of the church. And then I quote 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. Whenever you see a number before the letter um, or the book, it just means that there's one there is more than one letter to the Thessalonians. So it's second, the second letter of the Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 15. It says, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. So even St. Paul is acknowledging both tradition and scripture, right? Our spoken word, which would be tradition, and by our letter would be scripture. And then Matthew chapter 28, 
which is the Great Commission, where he says, go therefore and baptize um, all the nations in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them all that I taught you. So that's Matthew 28. So he asked the disciples before he went up to heaven, Jesus asked the disciples to go and make other disciples. Because a disciple is a follower of Jesus, right? So as a follower of Jesus, you and I are called to make other followers of Jesus. Um, So he asked them to teach all that I taught you. And so... They did that in two ways, through tradition and scripture. But right now we're talking about sacred tradition. Point number four, sacred tradition is the inerrant teaching, which basically means without error. That's what inerrant means. Sacred tradition is the inerrant teaching of the church, which is guarded by the Holy Spirit. So there cannot be any error in sacred tradition, because it is guarded by the Holy Spirit. And scripture also is inerrant, because it is the inspired word of God. So both are without error. Jesus Christ made the Father's plan effective. So what was the Father's plan? The Father's plan was to save us. And Jesus brought that about. He redeemed us and restored us to the Father's favor through his Paschal mystery. And Paschal comes from the word Pasch, which means lamb. And going back to the Old Testament, the Jews used to sacrifice lambs um, in order to um, blot out sin or to make atonement for sin. And Jesus is the ultimate lamb that was sacrificed for us. So the Paschal mystery is the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. Jesus established his church with the power to bind and to loose. So he gave authority to Peter, the first pope, to bind and to loose. In other words... He gave the authority to the Pope to say, this is true, this is not true. This is what we believe as Catholics. Um, that's, uh, it's very rare that the, the Pope will invoke this authority. And it's done, the last time it was done was several years ago, I think it was, for the dogma of the Immaculate Conception in 1854 was the last time that was invoked. Yes? I think it was a dogma, I think it was assumption. That's right. 1956? Uh, early 1950s, remember? Or 54, maybe. 1954. You're right. The assumption came after that. Thank you. Yes. Um, that's why we have a team. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that sacred authority is not invoked very often. Okay, all right. Now, Jesus gave his apostles his own teaching authority. So Jesus had authority, right, as God, but he passed on that authority to his apostles, especially to Peter. He commanded his apostles to baptize and to preach. He promised his apostles that the Holy Spirit would teach them all things and enable them to remember everything he had taught them. Imagine you're one of the apostles. There was 12 of them, right? And Jesus goes off to the Father in heaven and he says, go and preach, baptize and preach. You might be a little bit afraid that you might forget some of the things that Jesus said or did, but Jesus assured them that the Holy Spirit would would remind them of all that Jesus had taught and did. 
So that must have been so consoling for them to hear, right? Um, the Holy Spirit guides and guards the church's teaching in every age. Through the apostles and their successors, sacred tradition preserves the fullness of revelation, unchanging for all generations. So sacred tradition preserves the fullness of revelation and it's unchanging for all generations. Yet sacred tradition and sacred scripture are intimately connected. They are, because they come from the same source, coming from God himself. Imagine you can see two streams coming from the same source, right? So one is sacred tradition and the other one is sacred scripture, but they both have the same divine wellspring. Sacred tradition predates sacred scripture, right? It, sacred tradition came first, and sacred scripture comes from sacred tradition. And here's something that is really necessary to say. The magisterium, which is the teaching office of the church, authentically interprets sacred tradition and sacred scripture. So we don't interpret scripture and tradition on our own. The magisterium, magister means teacher. The church's teaching authority will interpret that for us. So that's why, that's the difference between Protestants and Catholics. Because Protestants basically say, well, I can interpret scripture on my own. Well, the problem with that is if you have person A over here thinks such and such about a certain Bible passage, you have person B over here that has something completely contradictory. That's why we have so many different Protestant denominations, right? So we need the Holy Spirit to guide us, to guide the church, to tell us what the scripture, what tradition and scripture really mean. Um, the magisterium consists of the Pope and the bishops in union with him. The magisterium is the servant of God's revelation in tradition and scripture. So it's a servant. Um, the teaching authority of the church is a servant there to listen to the Holy Spirit. The church is certain about all revealed truths coming from tradition and scripture. Why? Because it's without error. Because both are guided by the same Holy Spirit. They both have the same source. Without tradition, there is confusion and even chaos about what the Bible means on crucial doctrines. One of those is faith. Because Protestants believe other Christians believe that all we have to do is accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and then we're going straight to heaven, straight shot. But as Catholics, that's not what we believe. We believe that, yes, we need faith, uh, but we're saved by grace, the grace of God. Um, and faith, if it's authentic, will be accompanied by works right, actions, your faith will um, have actions to it to show that you really are a follower of Jesus, and the truth is, we have been saved, we are being saved right now, and we will be saved, so it's not a guarantee that I'm going to heaven necessarily, um, I have, to, I have to finish the race well. Um, as St. Paul talked about, I have fought the good fight. I have run the race. He had lived his life, not all of it, but a good chunk of it for Jesus. And that's why he could say that confidently. Um, all right. So 
Through the authority to bind and loose, the church proclaims dogmas, which are teachings, um, which are held as authentic teachings of Jesus. Dogmas are solemn teachings of the church. And those dogmas are something that we are required as Catholics to believe. Just as Kurt just mentioned, the one in 1954, probably somewhere in there, the assumption of Mary, that Mary went to heaven both body and soul. That's just an example. Um, yes? So what's the difference between a doctrine and a dogma? Uh, dogmas, uh, doctrines are teachings of the church, uh, but dogmas, like you must believe in dogmas to be Catholic. That's my understanding. Um, does anybody else have any comments on that? Okay. All right, sacred scripture is the written teaching of God. Sacred scripture is the inspired written word of God, both Old and New Testaments. Um, when I use the word inspire, there's another word that's like spirate, like um, think of the Holy Spirit that breathes into a person that gives them insight and the knowledge of what he wants uh, to say through that human author. So he's not taking over the person. They still have the ability to use their own mind and their background, their cultural context, all of that would go into, that's why all of that would go into uh, their writing, but the Holy Spirit would not allow them to write anything that was not of God, basically. Um, that's why we have different writing styles, because the Bible is, has many different books in it, and we have many different human authors, but there's one primary author, and that's God himself. Okay, so scripture is a gift to us from God. God the Father wants all to be saved and to come to know him. Scripture is a record of God's love. It's a love letter to humanity. Isn't that beautiful? The love letter, it's so true. Because it's a love, love, love letter because from the beginning to the very end, what it, God is passionately pursuing his people. He wants us to be with him forever in heaven. And the Bible is all about that passionate pursuing of us. It speaks, the Bible speaks of God's relationship with his creatures his love and his desire for us to respond to his love. In fact, in the Old Testament, God, and the New Testament too, but God was referred to as being like a husband and the church, the people of God, his bride. So God wants to be one with his bride. So sacred scripture is the book of the good news of salvation. This salvation is centered on the person of Jesus, the Word of God. The New Testament, which is the second half of your Bible, although most of the Bible, a lot of it is from the Old Testament, and um, maybe um, Mary can hold up her Bible and show you the difference of where the Old Testament is and the New Testament. So it's not quite half, it's, uh, the New Testament is maybe a fourth of the Bible. Yeah. So, uh, so the New Testament is hidden in the Old Testament, and the New Testament reveals the Old. So all that was said about the Messiah was fulfilled in the life teachings 
and Paschal mystery of Jesus. So basically, um, the Old Testament speaks of a Messiah to come, and the New Testament speaks of the Messiah that has come, Jesus. So it's the New Testament would be hidden in the Old. They wouldn't. They they knew that a Messiah was coming, but they didn't know who the Messiah would be. The Old Testament speaks of a Savior to come, and the New Testament speaks of Jesus the Savior. The church venerates or honors Scripture because it is the word of Jesus. Right? So it, when praying with the Bible, it would be appropriate in your, if in your house you have a stand for your Bible, like a book stand, or... Um, if you want to kiss your Bible um, after you read something from Scripture, that would be appropriate because you're really kissing God himself and honoring him. That's, those are just some ways, external ways, of venerating or honoring Scripture. Um, but the most important thing is to honor God in our minds and in our hearts as we approach the Bible. Scripture is essential to our Christian journey towards heaven. We need it. We need the Bible. It, believe it or not, there's like every kind of situation you could think of that you would ever need guidance on is found in Scripture, um, which is pretty amazing. It is food and instruction forever. Um, yes, forever, but it's supposed to be for every, so you can put a Y there. It is food and instruction for every aspect of our lives as Christians. Sorry for that typo. Number four, sacred scripture is the authentic word of God. It truly is the word of God. God himself is the primary author of scripture, as I mentioned before. So God used human instruments to write down his word. So it was under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, human authors used their own words, conditioned by their own times, culture, and modes of writing. They wrote only and exactly what God wanted to write. So scripture teaches without error the truths needed to get to heaven. Everything that is needed for our salvation you can find in scripture and in tradition. Sacred tradition of the church has determined which books are authentic revelations from the Holy Spirit. So, for example, in the Council of Hippo in the 4th century, that was the time that the bishops and the pope of the church got together in a council, meaning they gathered and they spoke about which books they, they discerned, they prayed about which books were, are actually inspired by God, which books are the authentic word of God because there were other books written that claimed to be the word of God like the gospel of Thomas which is not the inspired word of God right but if somebody wrote the gospel of Thomas and so the church decided no that is apocrypha that is false teaching we are not going to accept the gospel of Thomas so how we have the books that we actually have in the Bible that you are using today is through the Council of Hippo of the 4th century. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of history that goes into um, our beliefs. And um, it's through the authority of tradition that we have sacred scripture. And then, this is an important point, revelation is closed 
So basically meaning there can never be written any more books to the Bible, right? There's not going to be another gospel other than the four written gospels. There's not going to be any more New Testament writings. It's closed. The writings from the Bible are perpetual for all time, never to be subtracted from or added to. So when we got to the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, Martin Luther decided to take out certain books from the Bible. That's why the Protestant Bible is not the same as the Catholic Bible. There are, I don't know how many books, maybe somebody can, four? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's first and second Maccabees for sure. There's Sirach. Um, and then there are parts of Esther and parts of Daniel that are not in uh, the Protestant Bible. Um, and um, all the New Testament remains intact between Protestants and Catholics, but that's why we're handing you now a, a Catholic Bible. Um, sacred Scripture is the living and active Word of God, giving grace to its hearers. So it's living and effective. It is active because God is not dead. He is real. He's still alive, right? Jesus is still alive and with us. And he speaks to us through his word. Um, okay, so interpretation of scripture. This is very, very important because we cannot interpret scripture on our own. And I'll, I'll point to you from scripture itself that we're not supposed to interpret on our own. Second letter of St. Peter, chapter 1, verses 19 through 21 and we have something more sure, the prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but by men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. And then, um, I don't know if I put this here where this would be. I am now trying to find, ah, here we go. When we interpret scripture, we must read the Bible as a unity within the context of the whole. So when interpreting, we have to keep the Old and New Testaments in mind, the whole of scripture, and not just isolate a certain passage um, on its own. Scripture must be read with the eyes in understanding of faith, otherwise we're not going to understand it. The church's living tradition makes true and inerrant scripture possible, as we mentioned before, that scripture comes from tradition. It is possible to misunderstand the truths of scripture through private interpretation, as I mentioned before. So it's easy to fall into error when interpreting on your own without the church's guidance. This is why there are so many different Christian denominations. This is why the teaching authority of the church is needed for scriptural interpretation. My favorite passage to explain why we need the church for interpreting scripture is there was a deacon by the name of Philip who ran into an Ethiopian eunuch um, who was a servant uh, to the queen of Ethiopia. And he was reading a passage from Isaiah. Let's, let's go to that in Acts of the Apostles. That's right after the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, 
and after John is the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verse 26 and following. So at this point, Jesus had ascended to the Father, and the Pentecost had already happened. The Holy Spirit has come down upon the church, and they're beginning to spread the word of Jesus everywhere. So, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verse 26. Are we there? Yeah, you're, you're good. Yep, 26. You want to read that? I'm bad at reading. Okay. <laughs> you're fine. <laughs> Chapter 8, 26. Verse 26. Yeah. Philip and the Ethiopian. Then the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. Get up and heed and head south on the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, the desert route. Uh, so he got up and set out. Now there was an Ethiopian in there. Eunuch. E eunuch. Yeah. Um, a court official of the Candace, that is the queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury, who had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet, prophet of Isaiah, Isaiah. The spirit said to Philip, go and join up with the chariot. Philip ran up to the herd, ahead of, heard, heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you are reading? He said, how can I unless someone instructs me? So he invited Philip to get in and sit with him. This was the scripture passage as it was as he was reading. Continue on. Keep going. Yeah. Okay. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In this humiliation, justice was denied him, who will tell of his prophecy, for his life is taken from the earth. Keep going. Then the Ethiopian said to Philip in reply, I beg you, about whom, whom is the prophet saying that this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and began and beginning with the scripture passage, he proclaimed Jesus to him. As they traveled along the road, they came in, came to some water, and the Ethiopian said, Look, there is water. What is to prevent my being baptized? Then he ordered the chariot to stop, and Philip and the in, eunuch. eunuch both went down into the water, and be baptized, and he baptized him. When they came out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, but continued on his way rejoicing. Philip came to the came to Azotus, Azotus, yeah, and went about proclaiming the good news to all the towns until he reached. Caesarea. 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 That's good. Great. Excellent. Thank you for doing that. So interesting that the Ethiopian eunuch said, how can I, unless somebody explains it to me, how can I understand this passage? Because Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? How can I, unless I have someone to explain it to me? So that's why we need the church's teaching, uh, teaching authority to help us to understand scripture. Um, by the way, the word eunuch, um, it's not a pleasant detail, but basically um, male servants oftentimes were castrated. And so um, uh, that was a very common practice back in the day. 
Um, that's what the word eunuch means. Yeah, so. that. What's that? The desire of who the, whom they were serving. Which was the yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then um, scripture can be understood. So this is we're all talking about interpreting scripture. So it can be understood literally, but also figuratively through typology, and I'll explain what that is in a second, and through understanding how we are to act morally and how we are led towards heaven. So typology basically means that, let me give you an example. I don't think I explained it very well in the last class, but basically with Adam, he was priest, prophet, and king. So Adam is a type of Jesus. Right? Because Jesus is priest, prophet, and king. Adam is also the universal bridegroom, as I mentioned. And who is the ultimate universal bridegroom? That's Jesus. So that's typology. Something that we see in the Old Testament that is a type of Jesus. So another... And then I talk about how we are to act morally, and how we are led towards heaven. So those are, I won't give you the technical terms for all of those, because it's like anagogical and whatever. So um, you don't need to know those. But just know that when you take a scripture, when it talks, for example, about the temple, we can think of the literal temple from the Old Testament but we can also understand the temple figuratively. Um, so like the temple is a type of the church. Um, and we can also understand how we are to act morally. Like when we're baptized, we become temples. So we don't want to do anything that would defile the temple of our bodies, right? So that's moral instruction. And then... How we are led towards heaven would be that ultimately we're longing and we're going uh, forward in life towards the ultimate goal would be to be with God in the temple of heaven. Um, so that's different ways that we can interpret scripture. Um, it could be one passage but looked at in terms of different angles. Does that make sense? Okay. So we're going to do a little review right now. So the oral teaching of Jesus is what? What is it? Oral. What? No. It's right there. Tradition, yeah. All right, and the written teaching of Jesus is? Scripture, right. So both Tradition and scripture are given and interpreted through the magisterium of the church. Magisterium is just a big word to mean teacher or teaching authority. So let's review. I think it's the same. I have an older version than you. I have a red book and you have a white book, but it's the same book. So let's make sure it's the same page numbers. Page 31 and 32, just for a summary. Thirty-one and thirty-two. Are those doctrinal statements? At the bottom. At the bottom? Yes. It starts with Jesus Christ, the fullness of revelation. Okay, great. We have the same pages. Awesome. Okay. Jesus Christ, the fullness of revelation, entrusted his mission, his mission to save, to the apostles. They transmitted Christ's gospel through their witness, preaching, and writing under the guidance of the Holy Spirit meant for all people until Christ comes in glory. So we've kind of already talked about that, but it's just good to review um, these things. Next page, 32, at the top. Divine revelation is transmitted through apostolic tradition and sacred scripture, 
which flow from the same divine wellspring and work together in unity towards the same goal. So apostolic tradition, the word apostolic comes from the word apostle, which means sent. So the, there were 12 in the beginning, 12 apostles appointed by Jesus. So transmitted divine revelation. So how God reveals himself is transmitted in two ways, tradition and scripture. Next point, the church and her doctrine, life and worship, perpetuates and transmits to every generation all that she is, all that she herself is, and all that she believes. That is what we mean by the term tradition. Because of the divine gift of faith, God's people as a whole never ceases to receive and reflect on the gift of divine revelation. So we're constantly receiving and reflecting on tradition and scripture. Every mass that we go to, we're doing that, right? The teaching office of the church, the magisterium, that is the Pope and the bishops in communion with him has the task of authoritatively interpreting the word of God contained in sacred scripture and transmitted by sacred tradition. Next point. Sacred scripture is inspired by God and truly contains the word of God. This action of God is referred to as inspiration. So when the Holy Spirit um, inspired uh, human authors to write his words down, Basically, that's inspiration. God is the author of sacred scripture, inspiring the human authors, acting in and through them. Thus, God ensured that the authors taught divine and saving truth without error. The Catholic Church accepts and venerates as inspired the 46 books of the Old Testament. This would be good to know. 46 books in the Old Testament, and 27 books of the New Testament. Now remember, that number is different for Protestants, right? The unity of the Old and New Testaments flows from the revealed unity of God's loving plan to save us. Our response to God's revelation is faith by which we surrender our whole lives to him. And that is a very involved sentence. Um, like, what do we, when God reveals himself to us, like, he lets us know that he's a God of love, that he's a God of mercy, he is a good God, a good father who loves us. That res requires a response from our part. What are we going to do with all that love? Are we just going to be like, okay, that's nice, God, and then go, go along and nothing changed? Or are we going to actually respond in love and that love be manifested through our words and our actions. So um, you can stop the video. <laughs> 